Welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church in Gladstone, Michigan. I'm Kathy Rafferty, the pastor here, and I am glad to be here. I'm glad that you are joining us for worship, and I am glad that God is with us as well as we gather for worship on this Palm Sunday morning. As we move through Holy Week in this coming week, I hope that you will also be able to join us for our Monday, Thursday service and Good Friday service at 7 p.m. and again on Easter Sunday morning. If you connect with us on our website or Facebook or send us your email, we'll do our best to keep you up to date with what's happening here in this time when the building is closed. We are sending out a at-home worship guide for those of you who have given us your emails, and I hope you've had time to find that as we're beginning together this morning. We'll show our contact information at the end, and we are still checking the U.S. mail as well as our phone messages and email to stay connected. For now, though, will you please join with me in a spirit of prayer? Ruler of our hearts and lives, as the crowd shouted in joy when the gates of the city swung open to welcome the humble king so long ago, so may our hearts be open with the joy of Christ's spirit among us. As Jesus wept over Jerusalem while its leaders schemed against him, so may we weep for our communities, for our symbols of power and authority, and for all of us who know not what we may yet do in these times. As we gather to worship on this Palm Sunday, may we find the grace and the courage to continue the journey of Jesus through this Holy Week until we come at last through it all to Easter resurrection. Amen. Let's take a few deep breaths to center ourselves for worship, imagining ourselves parading in on this Palm Sunday as we listen to Hosanna, Loud Hosanna played by Deb Hubbard for us on piano. Today's reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend 
in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. This is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and followed were shouting, Hosanna to son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet of Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Familiar words from the Palm Sunday story, ancient words quoted from the Hebrew prophet Zechariah. The name Zechariah means God has remembered. He originally spoke these words to a people who had been all but obliterated by the empires that had conquered them. Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Some 500 years later, Matthew's gospel echoes the prophet Zechariah's words, anchoring Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in the ancient hope of the people of God. Still today, these words remind us, the followers of Christ, what it is we are called to hope for as we enter into this holy week. Look, your king 
is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Our king is not like other kings, not like the rulers of empires who trample back and forth across the lands and lives of the weak and vulnerable throughout the long history of the people of God. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, all titles for kings. Our Jesus of Nazareth is not like other kings. Our king was born in a stable in the town of Bethlehem. O Bethlehem of Judah, you are not just a lowly village in Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Our king came from Nazareth. Nazareth! Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Our king told the teacher, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. Born again. How can this be? Our king, a Jewish man, met a Samaritan woman at a well and offered her living water. And he didn't even have a bucket. Our king wept when his friend Lazarus died and then called him back to life. He told Martha, Lazarus' sister, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. Our king is not like other kings. See, look, your king comes to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Our king doesn't come wielding the same sort of power and privilege we expect from other kings. Jesus didn't come into Jerusalem at all, like the conquering Roman rulers that the people were used to. Pontius Pilate would have been coming from the Roman seaside city of Caesarea to be present in Jerusalem for the Jewish holy days. Not because Pontius Pilate cared anything for the religious traditions of the occupied Jewish people, but he would be there to remind the people in Jerusalem who was in charge. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of both Roman imperial power and Roman imperial theology. In the Roman Empire, of which Jerusalem was a tiny part, the only king, or even God, who mattered was the Roman emperor. Anyone who was foolish enough to publicly disagree would be swiftly and brutally dealt with. Our king doesn't wage war with troops or guns or bombs, death, destruction, and violence. Our king is the Prince of Peace. Are we invested in the wars of this world? In military might? Or are we invested in the way of peace, of nonviolent protest? Our king doesn't enforce control and compliance through compulsion or intimidation or bullying. Our king is called Wonderful Counselor. Are we grasping for power and control over others? Or are we listening for shared wisdom and working for real relationships? Our king doesn't stockpile wealth and celebrate victory at the expense of the defeated or the marginalized. Our king has come among us as one who serves, a shepherd who seeks the lost, a physician who heals the sick, a savior who eats with sinners. Are we striving to be masters? or seeking to serve? Are we holding as tightly as we can to what we've already found? Or looking for those who are still lost? 
Are we longing for the comforts of our own safe place? Or are we reaching out to help the most vulnerable? Our king is not like other kings. Our king enters the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Followers from the countryside prepare his way, not soldiers, not ambassadors. He's greeted by crowds from the city streets, not government officials nor religious authorities. By the end of the week, we'll see our king hanging on a cross rather than seated on a throne. Everything we read in the Bible, all those stories of Jesus we love to tell, tell us our king is not like other kings. Wouldn't it seem then that those of us who would follow our king shouldn't be like other people? like those who follow other kings? Shouldn't our lives be different if our king is so very different? Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, tells us how our lives might be different if we would truly follow this king who is not like other kings. At the start of chapter 2, in the letter to the Philippians, Paul writes this. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, meaning in your king, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or from conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And then it continues with what Dennis read this morning. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. And even death on a cross, How different would our lives be if we lived our lives with our king always in mind? Christ Jesus, our king, who is not like other kings. As Christians, that is what we are called to do. As followers of Jesus Christ, Christ, our King, who is not like other kings, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to live lives that are not like other lives. We are called to live not as those who live in this world, subject to the kings of this world, but as those who live in the kingdom of God. From that perspective, many of my own complaints and frustrations, even disappointments, in these recent days seem petty and insignificant. Having the mind of Christ seems. Yet Paul doesn't just tell us what we should do. He also tells us why. With Christ as our king, we are able to do it. How it is with Christ as our king, we can have that mind of Christ. Paul tells us that in our connection to Christ, being united with Christ, we find what we need to live kingdom lives. Even in, especially in, these strange times. In Christ, we have encouragement. 
We have comfort from his love. We have a sharing in the spirit, a tenderness, a compassion. In Christ, we have the ultimate example of how to live our lives, emptying ourselves, taking the position of the servant, humbling ourselves, being obedient to God to the point of surrendering our very lives, trusting that in Christ, we will overcome even death, believing even in the face of death that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Paul is also clear that in living our lives in Christ, we are also called to live in Christian community. We cannot live like Jesus alone because that's not how Jesus lived. As we are united with Christ, so too we are united one another. We are united as the body of Christ. Paul encourages us to be like-minded, having the same love, be one in spirit, one in purpose. We need each other in God's kingdom. Each of you, Paul writes, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So how are our lives different because we proclaim Jesus Christ to be our king? Today, we shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. We wave palm branches and tell the stories of Jesus, our king. What difference does it make in the way we live our lives? Would we be like the crowds who shout, Hosanna, and then before the week is out, cry, crucify him? Or will we be different? Will those who watch in the days ahead through Holy Thursday and Good Friday and on to Easter know that we are followers of Jesus? Will those who watch us see what difference that makes in our lives? Will we ourselves know and see what it means to follow a king who is not like other kings? Will we find the time and the space in this holy week to draw near to God, to listen to Jesus, to sense the Holy Spirit, to trust in the resurrection to come, to be together one in spirit and purpose? Are we willing to humble ourselves? to surrender our lives, to renew our loyalties to this king who is not like other kings? I pray it would be so. Through Christ Jesus, our king, who is not like other kings, our king who comes to us gentle, humble, and riding on a donkey. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each week we receive an offering as an act of worship. Through our giving, we express our hope for the future and our commitment to work together for that future as God intends for it to be. It is my hope and prayer that each of you will find ways to give of yourself in this week. You may give financially to Memorial United Methodist Church in Gladstone, online at our website or by mailing a check in the U.S. mail. We'll show our contact information at the end. And it is because so many of you give on a regular basis that we are able to have this ministry, our ministry of worship as well as our outreach in mission to our community and to our world. For that, I am deeply grateful to you.
Each week we also share our prayers together, our prayer request cards. We gather together and share our joys and our concerns and whatever is on our hearts. And those of you for whom we have email have received the prayer list and I trust that in this week you will pray for the names on that. You'll also find it posted on our website. You can also contact us with prayer requests in the week ahead. But for today, for now, let's take a quiet moment to offer those prayers that are in our hearts, knowing we pray together as the gathered body of Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our King, you come to us. And so now we turn to you. There is so much on our hearts these days. We come with questions, wondering why. We come with fears and anger, frustrations and disappointments. We come in confusion. We come concerned for ourselves, concerned for those we love, concerned for our community and for people in places all over your world. Even with deep concern for your creation. We lift these things all into your care. Trusting in our King. Trusting in the promise of the kingdom of God. We pray especially this week for those who are struggling with COVID-19, those who are struggling to care for them. We thank you for those who face the dangers each day so that everyone is cared for, so that everyone is fed, so that the lights work and the water runs and the garbage is picked up. We pray, Lord, for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, We pray that as we move through this holy week, we will see that glimmer of light that is a resurrection promise. And now we pray as you have taught us in the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for watching and worshiping with us. I hope that you'll join us again on Thursday and Friday evenings at 7 p.m. as we walk through the days of Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday on our way toward Easter Resurrection. And as we conclude our time together now, I'll leave you with these words of blessing. Receive the blessing of God to whose kingdom we belong. Receive the blessing of Jesus who rules in humble service. Receive the blessing of spirit who draws us together in love and sends us out to serve. Go now in peace. Oh, I would ask that you do please keep listening 
to the postlude music. It's called Hold Your Fire. It's composed and performed by a dear friend of mine, Andre Viope from Traverse City. <laughs> 